Yeah, there was some discussion yesterday about uh, the speakers being limited to uh, 30 minute presentations and it seems to me it makes perfect sense because you go to most academic uh, conferences and give a presentation on anything, you're usually given an hour uh, but you usually have to spend the first half of that time explaining your philosophic principles and at a conference uh, with this particular title uh, the economics of fascism you'd have to explain, take, take a good 15 minutes to explain what fascism is and more so how to explain why you're opposed to it uh, <laughs> and then you'd have 30 minutes to actually get into the meat of the uh, uh, presentation and here we can cut, kind of cut through all of that and just get right to the meat of it without having to uh, establish a lot of credentials. I first got uh, introduced to uh, the area of uh, economic historical revisionism uh, through Murray Rothbard back in 1963. I'd written a rather lengthy, one of these five to six page uh, uh, scathing attacks uh, was directed to uh, the author of a, uh, an academic uh, author of a, a textbook on antitrust law and take him to task for all of his uh, erroneous thinking and I sent a, a carbon copy of it to Murray. Now this was back in the days uh, for the, some of you younger people, there was actually a time when we didn't have uh, copying machines and uh, you had to use uh, uh, carbon paper. So I sent a carbon copy to Murray and he was kind enough to send me back one of his uh, traditional letters, you know, that uh, no margins uh, all the way across the page, a typed uh, three or four page uh, uh, letter. Uh, introducing me to this whole field of uh, economic revisionism and particularly the work of Gabriel Coco, which just come out uh, titled The Triumph of Conservatism which uh, dealt with how the business community had been responsible for creating uh, the bulk of the economic uh, regulation that existed in this country. And I've been familiar with the NRA, and this by the way is the National Recovery Administration. Uh, I have a license plate up on my wall in my office from the motor carrier industry from the NRA days and people come in and say, oh, National Rifle Association? I said, no, and it's not the National Restaurant Association either. It was the old National Recovery Administration. And I was familiar with that from having read uh, uh, the Schechter case when I was in law school in constitutional law and discovered one of my uh, endearing folk heroes, someone who continues to be a folk hero of mine, that was Joseph Schechter, a, uh, a kosher uh, poultry slaughtering uh, um, uh, ran a poultry slaughtering business in South Brooklyn uh, in a building which I've uh, since uh, seen not the building but where the building once stood is now a vacant lot and it's about 50 percent larger than this particular room so here's a very small businessman who brought down the cornerstone of this uh, uh, system that uh, uh, the business community had worked so hard to uh, put together so he became one of my my heroes and I th began doing some uh, research on the origins of the NRA, which uh, eventuated in this uh, particular uh, book uh, titled In Restraint of Trade, dealing with uh, not so much the history of the NRA as much as with the history of business thinking that produced the NRA, particularly from 1918 to 1938. And I began with the War Industries Board, and there was some discussion of that here yesterday, which was under the direction of uh, Bernard Baruch. And uh, under the War Industries Board, which uh, uh, basically governed the American economy during World War I, uh, the uh, board uh, politicized the bulk of the economic uh, life of America. So it played the uh, central role in the most elaborate and pervasive exercise of government regulation of economic activity undertaken uh, within America up until that time. And aided by a myriad of uh, other agencies and sub-agencies, uh, the War Industries Board afforded the business community the unprecedented opportunity uh, to experience business-directed government planning uh, as a tool for the central direction of American industry. And with the board functioning under 57 different commodity sections, uh, it had the power to control production and distribution, uh, to fix prices at which government bodies would uh, purchase commodities, and virtually all other major uh, facets of uh, economic uh, decision-making in this country. Historian uh, Frederick, Allen, or Fred Frederick Lewis Allen uh, stated that the War Industries Board had, quote, almost dictatorial power to decide to what uses the industrial machinery of the country might be applied. Uh, historians Robert Wiebe and uh, Robert Cuff uh, provide further depth into the extent to which the War Industries Board encouraged the business system to seek an effective cartelization of commerce and industry. And men of commerce and industry found uh, in the wartime management uh, of the War Industries Board a temporary respite from what many regarded as the killing pace of competition. 
Prior to becoming president of AT&T, uh, Walter Gifford told the U.S. Chamber of Commerce at a meeting in 1917, quote, we have never needed such organized industry as much as we need it now when we are engaged in this great war, and we have never needed it as much as we shall need it after this war is over when we shall be in the midst of a world competition of unknown proportions, end of quote. Uh, Robert Cuff got to the essence of the response of most business leaders uh, to the War Industries Board as a model for the business, quote, business cooperation. That became the slogan uh, for this time period between uh, 1918 and the early New Deal. Uh, quote, with a properly rationalized state system directed by businessmen and government, America would be able to combine the traditional genius of individualism and free enterprise with the modern efficiency of administrative centralization and state regulation, end of quote. The World War cliché of making the world safe for democracy uh, very quickly uh, morphed into a business campaign to make competition safe for business firms. The trade association was greatly uh, energized during the 1920s as a vehicle for fostering, fostering voluntary restraints on competition. One of the champions of the trade association movement was uh, our old pal Herbert Hoover, who I trust that no one in this gathering will mistake for an advocate of laissez-faire economics. Uh, who observed, while still Secretary of Commerce, quote, we are passing from a period of extremely individualistic action into a period of associational activities, end of quote. And the trade associations developed a number of codes of fair competition, and uh, they're all over the lot. I have, I've, you know, outlined and discussed a great number of them uh, here. I won't try to uh, summarize or even uh, characterize them. Uh, other than to say that they essentially were directed toward uh, businessmen quote, wanting to respect the position of their competitors, not undercutting prices, not engaging in trade piracy, which became a synonym for uh, engaging in competition, trying to attract a buyer away from another businessman with whom that businessman was already in negotiation for a contract. Uh, aggressive advertising campaigns and so forth. It was aggressive competition uh, that became unfair competition uh, to these people and got, work, uh, got them, uh, these concepts worked into these uh, voluntary uh, trade association codes. Uh, one of the principal champions of a system of industry regulated competition, uh, what came to be known as the new competition, was Arthur Jerome Eddy who proposed what many trade associations adopted, namely an open pricing system uh, that sought to stabilize prices through an open system of price reporting by individual firms. So depending upon how pri open pricing systems actually functioned, they received a mixed response uh, from the courts in antitrust prosecutions. And he also proposed the creation of a federal commission along the lines of the ICC that would license all corporations engaged in commerce and could punish those who engaged in, quote, dishonest, fraudulent, oppressive, and unfair business methods, end of quote. Unfair, again, being uh, uh, competitive methods that have an adverse effect on your competition. Unfair methods of competition became the boogeyman for business leaders and their trade associations, with the word unfair being basically synonymous with the word effective. It was aggressive competition in which individual firms were more concerned with the furtherance of their specific interests than with the collective interests of their industries uh, that most troubled uh, industry leaders. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Mansur Olson's uh, classic study, The Logic of Collective Action, uh, will recognize the dynamics uh, that are at work here, this uh, continual ten uh, attention between uh, individual and collective interests that, in my view, tends uh, uh, through the marketplace to always keep uh, business organizations relatively small. It's the interplay between individual and collective interests that makes cartels inherently stable, uh, unstable. And I, I, again, I trust that no one uh, uh, here has uh, any unfamiliarity with uh, a cartel as a very unstable uh, type of a system because of the, uh, the individual interests. Uh, while there may be uh, collective interests associated with the maintenance of a particular pricing policy, uh, it will always be to the individual firm's interest to undercut that with uh, special deals and, and, uh, and the like. A competition, which was a product of the freedom to pursue one's self-interest, became a threat to firms uh, whose greater size and vertically structured organization made them increasingly less resilient and less adaptive uh, to change. In his 1930 study, Arthur Dewing noted, quote, the difficulties attending the administrative management 
of a large business, end of quote, a problem that tended to make mergers uh, a disappointment to many. In a study involving 10 unrelated uh, companies, doing observed that combined post-consolidation earnings averaged about 65% of pre-consolidation uh, earnings. Um, Gabriel Coco has demonstrated that following the 1901 merger that created United States Steel, its market share dropped from 61.6% .6 in 1901 to 39.9% by 1920. Likewise, the 1902 merger that produced International Harvester saw a decline in market share from 85% in 1902 uh, to 64% by 1918. And from the early 1900s and continuing well into the 1930s, competition uh, had become quite intense. Uh, not simply the kind of competition uh, that uh, arose in the form of new entrants into existing industries, uh, but the emergence of major new industries, along with major new methods of manufacture and product distribution, uh, automobiles, airplanes, electrical power, uh, along with products powered by electricity, including the radio, motion pictures, consumer appliances, and the phonograph were developed. And so these uh, increased the, uh, the, the tempo of competition during this time period. Uh, the petroleum industry, for example, which heretofore existed primarily as a source of lighting, uh, became the fuel source for automobiles. And we now found uh, petroleum, coal, and elect uh, electricity now in sharp competition with one another as power sources. So this is what's going on uh, during this period. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter's uh, process of creative destruction uh, helps to explain the condition in which many businesses found themselves, in, noting that Price competition was not the most significant factor to, firm, to which firms had to respond, quote, but the competition from the new commodity, the new technology, the new source of supply, the new type of organization, uh, end of quote. And citing retailing, uh, as an example, Schumpeter observed that it was not, quote, the additional shops of the same type that provided the greatest competitive threat, but the department store, the chain store, the mail order house, and the supermarket, end of quote. A, a kind of mentality, a kind of thinking that one continues to find uh, expressed in uh, the continuing uh, mindless uh, wars against uh, Walmart and other freestanding stores today. The, the, it's the same thinking. It just continues. Uh, the intensity of competition can be found in the patterns of prices in various industries. Uh, the petroleum industry saw production levels rise from uh, 442.9 million barrels in 1920 to 901.1 .1 million barrels in 1927. Uh, as a consequence, average prices for crude oil fell from just over three dollars a barrel in 1920 to a dollar a barrel by 1929. Again, sometimes <laughs> comparing that with uh, today, there was actually uh, one piece of uh, research I ran across that uh, it was it was an aberration. It wasn't typical, but uh, I think it was in the mid-continent area that at one time uh, barrels of oil were selling for ten cents a barrel. Um, Coal prices, which rose from $1.13 per ton in 1915 to 3.75 per ton by 1920, and this largely because of the demands of, of war, and which keep, keeping in mind this was all being carefully managed and directed by the War Industries Board, uh, encouraged the opening of new mines and a proliferation of supply, along with aggressive competition among coal companies. As a result, from the 1920 average price of $3.75 per ton, prices uh, plummeted to an average of $1.31 uh, per ton by 1932. Regarding retailing, uh, the development again of chain stores, direct selling by manufacturers, vertically integrated retailing organizations, and new consumer uh, credit practices added competitive pressures to which industry members made a variety of responses, and keeping in mind they're trying to make some of these responses through these voluntary uh, trade association uh, arrangements. Uh, the steel industry. Uh, was also experiencing the price-reducing consequences of free competition. Uh, no one in all of business uh, devoted more energy to the gospel of, co uh, of business cooperation than Elbert Gary. His message was encapsulated in these words, quote, I do think that sometimes competition, which I have said is a great thing for all the people, has been carried too far, and from the motives of selfishness we sometimes secure business for ourselves that really, justly, and naturally belongs to some of our competitors, end of quote. <coughs> George W. Perkins, the right-hand man of, uh, of, of J.P. Morgan and a director of both U.S. Steel and International Harvester, uh, echoed Gary's uh, remarks. He said, quote, I believe in cooperation and organization in industry. 
I believe in this for both labor and capital under strict regulation and control of the federal government. End of quote. Uh, Julius Kahn, president of Truscan Steel Company, declared in 1928, keep the year 1928 in mind, it's going to be kind of interesting here, quote, the government must assume the trusteeship of our welfare, end of quote, uh, adding that, quote, every solution to the problems of bad business, I feel, must emanate from a guiding central authority, namely our government, end of quote. In what was to prove to be a poor piece of prophecy, Kahn saw in the government direction of business the opportunity to achieve greater industrial stability, quote, just as it has been made possible to regulate against financial depressions and panics through a central body, our Federal Reserve Board, <laughs> end of quote. And I believe that uh, Murray just uh, rolled over in his grave on that one. Um, so Ayn Rand would have looked in vain for a real-life Hank Reardon uh, in the American steel industry, at least at this particular point in time. Industries endeavored futilely to restrain aggressive competition through trade association codes of fair competition, uh, which sought to appeal to social uh, peer pressure for compliance, but as with any kind of a marketplace cartel, uh, the absence of coercive means of enforcement led many industries to turn to the sector that could supply uh, coercive force, and that was the state. Following the Great Depression in 1929, uh, many business interests saw an opportunity to reinstitutionalize the old war industries board model. In 1931, Gerard Swope, uh, president of General Electric, gave a speech to the National Electrical Manufacturers Association in which he developed what came to be known appropriately as the Swope Plan. It would force all companies with 50 or more employees into trade associations to be supervised by the federal government. The trade associations would be permitted, among other powers, to define and enforce, quote, trade practices, business ethics, methods of standard accounting, and cost practice, end of quote, as well as to, quote, collect and distribute information on volume of business transaction transacted inventories of merchandise on hand, simplification and standardization of products, stabilization of prices, and all matters which may arise from time to time relating to the growth and development of industry and commerce. You know, in other words, whatever they want to regulate. In words that could well have been provided by George Orwell, this plan spoke of the, quote, voluntary acceptance of decentralized mandatory government of industry, end of quote. You know, he fit, fit in very well with the uh, current White House. Uh, major business leaders immediately fell in love with the SWOP plan, including officials from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers. General Electric's Owen Young got to the heart of the fascist nature of this proposal when he declared, quote, every advance in social organization requires the voluntary surrender of a certain amount of individual freedom by the majority and the ultimate coercion of the minority, end of quote. You know, voluntary coercion, that's nice. <laughs> Uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce President Henry I. Harriman added that any business that did not choose to, quote, cooperate with the recovery plan would, quote, be treated like any maverick. They'll be roped, branded, and made to run with the herd, end of quote. Uh, lest anyone here be deluded by Ayn Rand's notion of big business as America's persecuted minority, uh, the history of this era reveals how attracted uh, major business leaders were to having the coercive arm of the state available to serve their anti-competitive ends. Uh, one of my other uh, moderate heroes, uh, General Smedley Butler, I don't know if you're familiar with him, wrote the book War is a Racket. I'd like to imagine he's probably a relative of mine. My, my first name is my Irish grandmother's old family name, so maybe Smedley and I had some uh, relationship there. Uh, but his first-hand narrative of uh, the realities of government regulation, and John P. Diggins has studied that uh, Tom just re referred to a little while ago, the view from America, confirm, confirm the prevailing corporate state uh, partnership. Uh, Diggins has documented the enthusiasm that so many business leaders had with Mussolini. Uh, Julius Barnes and Lewis Pearson, each of whom had served as president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, were eager supporters of Mussolini. Uh, Pearson hailed El Duce for having restored, quote, the ideals of individualism. Uh, his words, not mine. Uh, other business praise for Mussolini came from Willis Booth, Vice President of Guaranteed Trust Company, James Emery, Counsel for the NAM, E.H.H. H. Simmons, President of the New York Stock Exchange, Albert Gary of U.S. Steel, Thomas W. Lamont, Head of L uh, J.P. Morgan, Otto Kahn of Kuhn, Leopold and Company, and Andrew W. Mellon. Lamont went so far as to refer to himself as a, quote, missionary, end of quote, for Italian fascism. Well, uh, by 1932, with the presidential campaign uh, afoot and with the Depression not uh, having, the effects of it not having subsided, 
due largely to uh, some of the policies that uh, uh, Rothbard talks about in his book, The Great Depression, about uh, Hoover saying that uh, he was not a do-nothing uh, president, uh, he was a do-everything president. Hoover was an engineer, engineers like to tinker, and uh, as Murray said, you know, there are about uh, six or eight different things that a government could do to uh, prevent the recovery of a depression, and Hoover did every one of them. Uh, and, and so during the uh, presidential campaign, the business community uh, uh, turns to these two presidential candidates, Hoover and FDR, to see if they will support the SWOP plan as a system for national uh, industrial cartelization, I mean, uh, recovery. Um, Hoover says no, uh, not because, I think so much because he's opposed to uh, that uh, kind of a system, but he thought that the uh, proposal would violate the antitrust laws, which I don't quite understand because the antitrust laws and the uh, the NRA would be co-equal, and you, know, you couldn't say one takes priority over the other. Uh, FDR, of course, eagerly uh, embraced it, and the business community responded by overwhelmingly uh, embracing FDR uh, with his industrial recovery plan, which became the cornerstone of the New Deal. So this old myth that uh, uh, FDR brought the business community kicking and screaming into a system of government regulation is about as silly as you can imagine. Uh, it's more correct to say that the business community brought uh, FDR into the White House and, and not kicking or screaming. The, uh, when FDR got elected, uh, the basic structure of the SWOP plan was enacted on June 13, 1933 as a National Industrial Recovery Act, and it had a life of two years. It was, they had to put a sunset provision in there. Uh, General Hugh Johnson, who had been the right-hand man to Bernard Baruch under the old War Industries Board, and you notice how military leaders uh, always seem to be assigned to take over regimenting functions in our society, uh, was appointed to head the, uh, the NIRA. And the NI NIRA, the National Industrial Recovery Administration, uh, was uh, uh, sort of made fun of, I think it was by a Business Week article, uh, that referred to NIRA as NIRA, as in NIRA, my God to thee. And uh, Johnson took great offense at this, uh, Johnson had described the NRA as, quote, a holy thing, the greatest social advance since the days of Jesus Christ, end of quote. <laughs> and that was just too much for him, so he knocked, of his own volition, just knocked the eye out of it, and it became uh, the NRA. Uh, in the fascist spirit of the system, Baruch proposed the creation of NRA insignias for businesses to use to identify themselves as, quote, soldiers against the common enemy within end of quote, and to differentiate them from those who, quote, are on the other side, end of quote. You know, fascists do have a love for insignias, um, whatever they may be. Uh, hundreds of NRA codes were developed, uh, about 557 basic codes and 208 supplementary codes. Uh, one writer has suggested there may have been as many as 2,000 codes by the time you get a lot of these cross-reference codes. In other words, particular industry could be subject to a number of of uh, separate uh, codes of fair competition as they were referred to. Some of them were uh, major industries, you know, steel, uh, cement, uh, auto manufacturing, uh, cotton textiles, motor carriers, and so forth. And some were rather esoteric uh, industries, corn cob pipe manufacturers, uh, umbrella handle manufacturers, envelope manufacturers, steel wool manufacturers, even burlesque theater had a, uh, uh, a code and, and you remember the, the, the model for it. If you ever see any movie that uh, takes place in America in the 1933 to 35 period, one of the things they always put in there someplace is the, uh, the, uh, the Blue Eagle out there. You know, NRA, we do our part. And I can just imagine that at a burlesque theater. Um, <laughs> uh, the most popular code provisions uh, dealt with pricing policies in virtually every imaginable form, while others dealt with defamation of a competitor, plant expansion, uh, the most popular code provisions uh, dealt with pricing policies in virtually every imaginable form, while others dealt with defamation of a competitor, plant expansions, and trade piracy, again, uh, trying to secure business from a customer who's negotiating with one's competitor. One commentator observed, quote, many of the pending codes have no purpose other than uh, to destroy some strategic advantage gained by the foresight, the energy, or the skill of some individuals or groups to the envy of their competitors. Um, historian Paul Konkin observed that, quote, usually without direct price setting, most industry codes achieve the same result indirectly by limiting production, preventing price cutting, and forbidding unfair competition. 
Uh, Business Week commented in the early days of the code formation, commented about the, quote, wild rush of businessmen to Washington who want to know everything, but mostly how to punish the rascal who has been cutting prices in their industry and how to fix some nice new prices, end of quote. You know, once the, the price structure becomes broken, you've got to fix it, you know, and that's, that seems to be the logic here. Um, that the stabilization of prices is precisely the wrong strategy for promoting recovery following the Depression was paradoxically not a consideration for an agency supposedly devoted to recovery, something that was spoken of yesterday. Contrary to the bunkum that passes for social enlightenment in our culture, the business community uh, loved the NRA. Uh, it, its support arose not from a desperate reaction to the, the, the Depression, but from years of dedication to a, a state, uh, getting a state-enforced system of uh, controlled trade practices. Harry Thayer, the former president of Western Electric, went so far as to say that, quote, the enactment of the NRA seemed to be almost worth the price of the Depression. End of quote. Um, as the NRA moved closer to its two-year sunset date, businessmen worked behind the scenes to reenact it as a permanent uh, system. In the late 1934 referendum, a member of the members of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce showed overwhelming allegiance uh, to the idea of a compulsory system for regulating trade practices. While 87 percent favored allowing the act to expire in June 1935, they also voiced support for the following, quote, for enactment of new legislation prior to expiration of the NRA, uh, 78.1 percent to mer- permit industry to formulate its own rules of fair competition subject to government approval, 95.2 percent to restricting the power of the government agency to approval or veto, 94.6 percent to have rules of fair competition enforceable against all concerns in the industry, 91.8 percent. And what these polls reflect, and you see this kind of across the board, wherever you see any kind of reference to uh, business uh, attitudes. They reflect the discontent that many business leaders had with how uh, the NRA was being administered. In other words, they wanted more direct uh, control and administration by business people themselves rather than uh, bureaucrats. They were not opposed to uh, the uh, idea of government enforcement of of some of these industry-created codes, as long as the business community could employ the power of the state uh, to enforce price, price stabilization and trade practice standards. Uh, they favored uh, these kinds of restraints on the market. There were a number of exceptions, uh, of lo- lovable exceptions. One of them, uh, and I would like to do some more research into this sometime if I ever dig out the time, the Illinois Manufacturers Association. I don't know if anyone is familiar with them, but they fought this whole pattern of governmental regulation from day one on. And I suspect there was probably someone who ran the Illinois Manufacturers Association who may have read a Mises or you know, had some sort of a philosophic uh, uh, opposition to this, but they were every, every time that some of this question comes up, here's the Illinois Manufacturers Association saying no when everyone else is saying yes. Uh, the Philadelphia New York Boards of Trade uh, favored termination of the NRA when it was uh, winding down. And, of course, my uh, old folk hero, uh, Joseph Schechter, uh, who I referred to uh, earlier, uh, a small uh, kosher uh, poultry slaughterer uh, in Brooklyn uh, who brought down this whole System and I, I always thought it'd be nice to have. They're going to put up put up all these monuments in Washington. To put up some monuments to some real heroes, uh, one of them would be uh, Joe Schechter. Uh, nor would my presentation be complete without making favorable comments to another of my folk heroes, uh, and uh, the one to whom uh, I have dedicated uh, my book. And that was a journalist, John T. Flynn, who Tom mentioned earlier, uh, uh, who had been who had the the, the Menkenesque quality of being both able and eager to discover and reveal the agreed-upon lies and foolishness uh, whose absence would be fatal to uh, all political systems. Well, uh, kind of running short on time, but following uh, the collapse of the NRA, and it was brought about uh, through the court saying in this particular case, as applied to uh, Schechter, there were two reasons for its collapse. One, the unlawful delegation of legislative power from, uh, the, uh, uh, from Congress to the executive branch. The other was in the case involving Schechter, uh, it didn't satisfy that definition of, of commerce. And so afterwards, you get a lot of industries that are out promoting uh, individualized uh, agencies or uh, individualized legislation. The Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act of 38, the Agriculture and Marketing Agreement Act of 37, the Motor Carrier Act of 35, Civil Aeronautics Act of 38, on and on, different industries getting in to do for their specific industries what the NRA had tried to do across the board. Uh, the appetite for fascism within the business community reached such a point that many within the independent retailing trades 
uh, anxious to overcome the competition from chain stores, became eager supporters of Texas Congressman Wright Patman's proposed, quote, death sentence, and that was what was referred to, the death sentence bill that would have allowed the federal taxation powers to literally confiscate chain stores out of existence. Um, and, uh, you know, anyone needing a reminder of what confiscate means should remember Charlie Anderson's definition of the movie in the movie Shenandoah when he says it's to steal. Uh, well, the A&P chain, for example, with 1938 earnings of just over $9 million, would have paid a chain store tax of $471.6 million. Uh, Kroger's earnings of just over $3.7 million would have been offset by a federal tax of over $71.8 million. Uh, had this measure been enacted into law, the 24 largest chains would have paid a total tax of $874 million in the first year alone, a figure that was almost 10 times their combined earnings and which would have supplied the federal government with some 13% of their total uh, budget. Uh, this bill, of course, was supported by many so-called independent retailers. Most of the uh, independent retailing uh, organizations, associations, were eager to get behind it and to put a stop to this uh, uh, wicked uh, system. Um, well, I, I think one can't understand the dynamics of what has long been generating an increased politicization of society, particularly within the economy, without understanding some of the institutionalizing processes at work. And I think this is something that needs to be understood in, in the light of what we're talking about here in terms of fascism. Uh, is Leopold Kor, I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, if not, very uh, interesting uh, writer. He is an Austrian by birth. I don't know you consider himself an Austrian uh, in terms of uh, his economic theories, but he considers himself both a libertarian and an anarchist, or he did when he was uh, living. Um, observed that there is a dysfunctional quality to organizational size, what he termed the size theory of social misery. Quote, whenever something is wrong, something is too big, end of quote. Uh, and he developed an analysis that ties in rather interestingly with uh, Olson's treatment of, of collective action. And I think what this does is to generate a what I call a dinosaur effect, that when a system becomes so specialized to a particular set of conditions that it loses resiliency and adaptability. Uh, then it really is unable to uh, sustain itself. And I think this is what happens with many large business organizations that eventually uh, they, they lose that uh, sense of competitiveness, that creativity. They become, as Coco called it, very conservative. Uh, they may have the advantages of economies of scale, but they're more than offset by the lack of resiliency and adaptability, and they can't respond to change very effectively. I've long been convinced, I'm thoroughly convinced now, uh, probably go to go to the gallows. Uh, the last uh, some of the last words H.L. Mencken once said, "My last words on the gallows will be to take a hoot at socialism." Mine will probably be to uh, emphasize this whole notion that uh, that large uh, large organizations of any size are quite incompatible with a free market. That a free market will tend to keep organizations, particularly business organizations, down to uh, particularly uh, you know, a much smaller level than they are now, that it takes a nation state to prop up uh, big corporations. There are a few corporations I think that probably could do this, but the only way they could really do it would be to retain this sense, an inwardly sense of uh, resiliency that, uh, that now seems to be uh, lacking. Well, uh, that's probably as good a place as any to end. I notice that the time is about up, but uh, perhaps the years were separating the war industry boards and the New Deal uh, and whose anti-market influences have metastasized into the present, uh, offer a stark confirmation of the classic libertarian sentiments of Adam Smith, who observed that, quote, people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public, or in some contrivance to raise prices. It is impossible indeed to prevent such meetings by any law which either could be executed or would be consistent with liberty and justice. But though the law cannot hinder people of the same trade from sometimes assembling together, it ought to do nothing to facilitate such assemblies, much less to render them necessary. So, thank you.